I know that this is going to be a big surprise to my audience, but I really like being right. It's just a thing that I like. Most of us do. But I really like being right, and weirdly enough, this story, even though it's, it's one of those things where I kind of hate being right, this kind of proves that what I, and believe me, it's not because I'm such a super genius, a lot of conservatives had been speculating on this for a long time, uh, that we were right about our characterization of how Justice Roberts actually came to the decision to save Obamacare. So we're going to go ahead and look at this. These are some excerpts from a new book that just came out, The Chief, The Life and Turbulent Times of Chief, Chief Justice John Roberts. And this is a book by Joan uh, Bis Biskupic. I have no idea how to pronounce that. But anyway, it's a new book that's out, and it does shed a little bit more light than we previously had on John Roberts and how he came to the decision to salvage Obamacare. So I'm going to read through just a few parts of this and comment on it. So uh, here, here's one. Roberts moves behind the scenes were as extraordinary as his ruling. He changed course multiple times. He was part of the majority of justices who initially voted in a private conference to strike down the individual insurance mandate, the heart of the law, but also voted to uphold an expansion for Medicaid for people near the poverty line. Two months later, Roberts had shifted on both. With final tallies 5-4 to uphold the individual mandate and 7-2 to curtail the Medicaid plan, came after weeks of negotiations and trade-offs amongst the justices. There's several parts of this that are incredibly disturbing and problematic. First of all, there's nothing wrong with a person changing their mind when they get new information. However, that is not the impression that we're getting from this particular article. The impression that is given is that Justice Roberts changed his mind several times not because he had new information, or not because he saw the law in a different light, or saw an argument that was specifically appealing to him and thus changed his opinion on what he already thought. Based on everything in this article, and I'm hoping that you know if I get a chance to read the full book that I'll have a little bit better handle on this, but based on these excerpts that I have provided by CNN, it seems as though his decision-making process essentially came down to how he was perceived and deals that he made with other justices. And that's not right. Because especially if you're looking at this last little line right here, that over the course of two months, Roberts had shifted back and forth on both of these stances that he held, not because he got new information, but because of what other justices were saying to him. That's not a good place to be in. Because it essentially makes it seem as though the court is no different than the legislature. See, that's something that's supposed to happen in the legislature. That there are supposed to be congressmen and senators and uh, house members, whatever, that, and, and also lobbyists that are, oddly enough, actually part of the thing, not in an official capacity, but you know what I'm saying. That there are concerned citizens or other people that come in and confer with them and give them new arguments and new information and change their opinions on things. And then the congressmen talk amongst themselves and build coalitions and do compromises and then come to a conclusion. It's not the way a justice is supposed to function. The way a justice is supposed to function is essentially the Supreme Court has exactly one job. To look at things and say, constitutional, not constitutional. That's it. That's not the impression that we're getting from this story about Chief Justice Roberts. That he was talking to other justices and wheeling and dealing behind the scenes and trying to get to a decision that he wanted rather than the decision that was either constitutional or not constitutional. And that is a real problem. So let's go ahead and read a little bit further on. The discussion focused on the individual insurance mandate and Congress's power to regulate commerce. Roberts went first, and as was the custom, laying out his views, he emphasized that he believed the Constitution's Commerce Clause never was intended to cover inactivity, such as the refusal to buy insurance. After the chief, Conservatives just, uh, conservative Justices Antonin Scalia, Anthony Kennedy, and Clarence Thomas. Okay, I, saying Anthony Kennedy is a conservative justice is a bit of a stretch, but let's continue. Uh, and Clarence Thomas offered their views. Like Roberts, 
They thought Congress's Commerce Authority did not cover an individual's decision to forego rather than to obtain health insurance. There were thus four immediate votes cast to invalidate the mandate. No one at the table was surprised. Based on the questions during oral arguments and word from law clerks inside the building circulating intelligence amongst the, the justices' chambers. Okay, so essentially, what we're getting told here is that Chief Justice Roberts believed that the Commerce Clause, and this was the justification for the bill being able to mandate that you must buy this product, you must buy health insurance, that, well, the reason that we have the constitutional authority to do that is because of the Commerce Clause, which is shaky at best because typically insurance doesn't cross state lines anyway. But even if it does, it doesn't cover inaction. In other words, you can't regulate somebody saying, well, I don't want to buy it. You might be able to regulate the business to a degree if someone wants to buy something and it is affected across state lines. In other words, if you live in Georgia and you want to buy a bunch of peaches from Chilton County, you could theoretically see how that could be regulated because it is crossing state lines and it is the federal government's job to regulate interstate commerce, at least to an extent. But the idea that you could say to the guy in Georgia, no, 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 you have to buy these peaches because it's crossing state lines. That's essentially what Justice Roberts and the other justices are saying here is like, you can't use the Commerce Clause to justify regulating an inaction, regulating a person's decision to not do something or to not engage in a marketplace. And yet, we see this shift happen in Justice Roberts that even though he still believes that and remains firm on it, he kind of just lets that little constitutional technicality slide so he can get the result that he wants. And this will be made clear in the next reading. No vote had been taken to congressional taxing power. It did not seem to matter, because the individual mandate was going to be struck down. The only uncertainty was whether any of, the Obamaca any of Obamacare would survive. Roberts did not want the entire law to fall. A pro-business conservative, he understood the importance of the insurance industry to U.S. business, and he was genuinely concerned about invalidating an entire law that had been approved through the democratic process to solve the intractable health care problem. Okay, so there's two really big red flags that pop up in that last statement. First of all, Roberts didn't want to invalidate the law because it was democratically passed. That's not your concern. Your concern is, is it constitutional? Is it not constitutional? Whether or not the law passed democratically, which Technically, it didn't because it was passed by elected officials that were voted on. But, you know, let's not parse. Let's not worry about the, the actual definitions here for, for just a moment. Because he's worried about a law that passed, and it did legitimately pass the House and the Senate and signed by the president. And I understand all that. He's saying, well, it passed that way, so I don't really want to strike down the whole thing. Why? That's not your concern. How it passed is not your concern. Your concern is, does it comply with the Constitution? Does it not comply with the Constitution? And if it doesn't, regardless of whether Congress and the President put it forward legitimately, if it doesn't mesh with the Constitution, you still got to strike it down. That's the way being a justice on the Supreme Court is supposed to work. And so that's the first major red flag. The second one is that essentially he didn't want... Uh, he um, Sorry, I'll... That, that was my last point. Um, he was saying that uh, even though he had not considered the congressional taxing power, he started looking for ways to save Obamacare is essentially the assertion that is, is given here. So that was previously not a question, but it became a question when Robert started looking for ways to save Obamacare. So his motivation was he didn't want to strike the whole thing down. So he changed his opinion on something, not because he found a way to make it constitutional, but instead because he didn't want the perception of his court striking it down. Which makes no sense. He's operating like an elected official. He's operating as though he's somebody that's running for re-election and wants the public's approval. That's not his job. And so he's already got the wrong motivation. Now he's got the wrong methodology that he starts searching for ways that I'm going to save it. 
So I've got to figure out a way to try to shove this square, square, blah, blah, square peg into a round hole so that I can justify saving the thing because that's the result I want. So he made a result in his head and then started looking for ways to justify it. That's not the way being a justice is supposed to work either. You're supposed to look at evidence and make a decision based on that evidence. That's the way this process is ideally supposed to work. And Roberts did it in reverse. That's not the way that you're supposed to reach a conclusion as a justice, especially a chief justice of the Supreme Court. So uh, let's look a little bit further down. But this for his fellow, um, but his four fellow conservatives believed that if the individual mandate was going down, it should take the whole law with it. They believed that all the pieces were interlocked. Roberts thought the individual mandate was entwined with only two other provisions, known as the community rating and the guaranteed issue. The community rating section prevented insurers from changing some individuals' higher premiums than others based on status. The guarantee issue section required insurers to cover people regardless of pre-existing conditions. So here's another problem that he ran into. Justice Roberts' main motivation seemed to be well, I don't want to strike down the entirety of it because it's connected to the individual mandate. I think that it should only be connected to this. But the other justices are saying, no, we have to gut the whole law because it's so interconnected that if we strike down the individual mandate, the rest of it is going to crumble. Which, by the way, is exactly the argument, oddly enough, that President Obama himself made about the individual mandate. Because people were saying, well, why don't you just take that provision out before it passed? And his explanation was essentially, if you take it out, then the whole thing's going to come down like a house of cards. Because that's what's funding the whole thing. The requirement that you have to buy insurance, that you have to be in the pool. And of course, President Obama was actually correct on that. But the point is, Roberts is trying to figure out a way to put up some scaffolding to hold this thing up. Because he wants to get rid of the individual mandate, but not the whole law, even though President Obama himself said that's exactly what is going to happen if the individual mandate is no longer a part of this. And so, finally, we'll just uh, look at this last little piece here. Breyer and Kagan had voted in private in a March conference to uphold the new Medicaid requirement, and their votes had been unequivocal, but they were pragmatists. If there was a chance that Roberts would cast a critical vote to uphold the central plank of Obamacare and negotiations in May were that they considered still shaky proposition, they were willing to meet him part way. When Ginsburg found out that Roberts knew position, her first thought was, it ain't over until it's over. She understood the process could continue to be fluid, especially in such a monumental case. People changed their minds about what they thought, so it isn't all that extraordinary, and that's how it should work. We're in the process of trying to persuade each other and the public, she told in a 2012 interview in her chamber. The reason this is so bothersome to me is when you read those couple of paragraphs, this is pure, unadulterated politics. And the whole point of having a Supreme Court is to keep politics out of it. They had a branch that was specifically selected to be as apolitical as humanly possible when you're talking about an actual branch of the government and to keep opinions and feelings and coalition building out of it. And that's the reason they are the ones that are supposed to review whether or not something is constitutional or not. Because what the other justices think about it is not supposed to play into it. And what you've got here is confirmation that behind the scenes, you had the liberal justices sort of wheeling and dealing, trying to get Roberts on their side. And you have to give them credit, it actually did work. But the way that this was handled was just so incredibly distasteful. And it just absolutely reeks of politics. And that is not something that you want in the Supreme Court. Now, even though I might not like the result, you have essentially the same thing said about Congress members. I don't say anything because it is their job to wheel and deal. It is their job to make laws and compromise and that kind of thing. It's not a justice's job to do that. 
And that's the reason that I have a real problem with this. So um, it looks like we've had a couple people that are trying to call in. So we'll go to calls right after this last little bit that I'm going to read. And this kind of summarizes the whole thing. And I want you to remember, uh, the person that's writing this is not necessarily somebody, I don't know what their political leanings are, but based on the writing and the way that they phrase it, I don't think that they're all that conservative. So this is the last paragraph that, that really kind of clinches the whole thing and, and summarizes it. Viewed only through a judicial lens, his moves, talking about Roberts, of course, were not consistent, and his legal arguments were not entirely coherent, but he brought people and their differences and interest, uh, different interests together. His moves may have been good for the country at the time of division and a real crisis in health care, even as they endangered in the years since, uh, engendered in the years since anger, confusion, and distrust. All right. So it seems as though the author, and maybe I'm mischaracterizing it, but it seems as though what the author is saying is, okay, yeah, from a strictly legal judicial lens, yeah, it's not consistent and it doesn't really make any sense and he didn't arrive at his conclusions the way that a justice really should, but, you know, it made fee- people feel real warm and fuzzy. Who the crap cares? Show me in the Constitution, open it up, Article 3, point to me the feel-good cause. It's not a justice's job to care what people's interests are. It is not a justice's job to try to bring people together. It is not a justice's job to try to make people feel good about what happened. A justice's job at the Supreme Court level is to decide, is this constitutional? Is it not constitutional? Period. End of story. And the idea that, well, it brought people together and maybe it didn't work out so well in the end, but that's justified because people felt good. No, none of that makes any sense. That is not your job. In fact, out of all the three branches of government, that's the only one that you shouldn't care what people think about it. That's the reason that they're not elected. That's the reason that they have lifetime appointments. Because they're not supposed to care what people think about the rulings. The only thing they're supposed to do is say whether it's constitutionally acceptable or not. And if not, you got to throw the law out. Or at least throw out parts of it. In this case, they probably would have had to have thrown the whole thing out, which I just laid out that case for. But the point in all of this is that you cannot just sit there and decide that because it made people feel good or because it brought people together, which of course, in the end, it really didn't, that that justifies not adhering to the Constitution. Oh, hey, what are you still doing here? Video's over. I'm off the clock, so go watch another one of my videos or something. Or better yet, you could subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell. And if you do that, then you'll get a notification when I actually am on the air and you can watch me then. In the meantime, I'm going to take a nap.